Well, joining me tonight for our August uh, Wednesday webinar series is Dr. Megan Williams from the Center of Veterinary Health Sciences. Um, and Dr. Williams is a surgeon here, equine surgeon, um, so specializes in a lot of lameness with horses. Mm -hmm. And tonight, she has graciously offered to um, host a webinar about arthritis and its management in the horse. So with that, Dr. Williams, I'll let you take it away. Okay. Hey, hello. So tonight, we're going to talk about arthritis in the horse. Uh, we will discuss normal synovial joint anatomy and function for horses. Um, different causes of arthritis, the more common ones that we see uh, symptoms. So how do you recognize that your horse has developed arthritis or is developing arthritis? Um, the most common um, treatments and the ones that I prefer to use in, in my practice. And then um, correlate this with some research that I am currently involved in at OSU. And give you a little more information on that and how you could get involved in some OSU research um, as well. So the synovial joint, and this is not necessarily restricted to horses, but uh, this illustration is from uh, the equine surgery textbook. So uh, it's composed of multiple components. So the bone on either, either end for the two bones that make up the joint, uh, articular cartilage, a coarse synovial fluid that lubricates the joint. Then there's fibrous joint capsule, which is represented by this thick line on the outside here. And then, um, the synovial membrane is on the inside of that capsule and that's where the synovial sites that produce synovial fluid are located. Then there are ligamentous structures that support the joint uh, from a stability standpoint. Usually there's a collateral ligament on either side and then depending on what joint we're talking about, there might be multiples of those uh, as well as it does get some support stability from the fibrous joint capsule itself. And then subchondral bone is the term we use for the bone that sits just beneath the layer of cartilage. So chondral meaning cartilage and sub meaning beneath. So subchondral bone is basically, you've got a cartilage layer right at the articular or the joint surface, the gliding surface of the joint. Uh, you've got the subchondral bone that's got a pretty dense vascular and nervous supply beneath that. And then you've got the long bone beyond it. So synovial fluid itself uh, is technically actually an ultra-filtrated version of the plasma in the blood. Uh, the synovia sites are the cells in that lining of the joint capsule that produce hyaluronian and lubricin, um, and that is what creates that lubricant that the joint fluid provides. Uh, so normal synovial fluid in the horse is a clearish, yellowish color and should have a decent amount of viscosity to it, where if I dripped it out of a syringe, there would be a string uh, coming from it. And this picture on this slide just illustrates, this is the inside of the joint um, during an arthroscopy, so you don't see the normal yellowish color to the fluid because it's all been flushed out uh, with the lavage solution that we use in surgery. Uh, but what I want you to appreciate from this is just um, the synovial villi, so all these kind of skinny looking little fingery um, substances in there, and then there's a little bit of the redder part, of the, those are blood vessels, that's synovial villi. The, the lining of the synovium of the joint that produces uh, joint fluid that then lubricates the joint. Uh, articular cartilage is what helps uh, for frictionless movement of the joint. It is glass-like um, and smooth in appearance normally. That's why it's called island cartilage. So this uh, picture is from the arthroscopy of a hawk in a horse. And this is highland, all that smooth, white, uh, pretty stuff is highland cartilage. So that's what normal highland cartilage in a, in a joint would look like in arthroscopy. Uh, it gets, cartilage doesn't have blood supply really to speak of, so it gets its nutrition through diffusion from the synovial fluid. Uh, the cells uh, in, in the cartilage are called chondrocytes, and then they produce an extracellular matrix composed of collagen, proteoglycan, and so this would be, if you remember just on the previous slide, the nice smooth glass-like hyaline cartilage. This next slide, um, is, these are from two different joints in a horse. The one on the left, just for reference, um, is looking down into the proximal intertarsal joint of a hawk. Uh, and the one on the right is actually the fetlock joint of a horse. And in both cases, you can see that that nice smooth glass-like appearance is not there. So this is like fibrocartilage scar tissue where the normal hyaline, hyaline cartilage is obliterated in the joint and that's due to arthritis. So these horses both have an, an advanced level of arthritis in the joints picture. 
Um, just quickly, you may hear your equine veterinarians talk about low versus high motion joints. Um, so high motion joints in a horse uh, will be anything with a significant gliding surface that there's a lot of movement to the leg when, when the horse ambulates. So a good example of a combination of the two uh, would be the hock of a horse. So there are technically four joints in the hock and the big joint on the top is a high motion joint. There's a lot of gliding surface there, but the three joints beneath it are what we would call low motion joints. Uh, they really take more concussive forces than anything else. There's not a lot of flexion, extension, or, or gliding surface on those joints. They're more responsible for shock absorption, not a lot of other motion of the limb. So osteoarthritis in horses, some of the symptoms that we see when a horse is arthritic, uh, lameness would be the most common presenting and the way that we diagnose it, right? Um, especially in earlier cases where maybe things aren't severe enough to cause a lameness, you might just see some joint swelling in the bigger joints that hold more fluid, particularly. Um, maybe the horse is just not as active as it typically is. Maybe they just feel a bit stiff when you ride them, especially if multiple limbs or multiple joints are affected. Uh, you might see a decrease in range of motion of the joint. Uh, that would be more of an issue with a chronic and severe arthritis to where the joint has been so distended and so inflamed over time that the joint capsule gets very thick uh, and then they won't be able to flex and extend the way they could previously. I, I would say a classic example of that um, is the fetlock joint in a horse that's raced for years and years. A lot of them will have um, some decreased range, range of motion in the ankles. Um, more subtle signs besides that in terms of performance, uh, maybe the horse just isn't performing up to snuff the way it usually does, just a decrease in their overall ability. Uh, sometimes something as simple as bucking, especially that's a relatively common complaint for horses with hawk arthritis, um, as well as inability to take a correct lead and or maintain it. Maybe they cross fire, cross canter, um, they just can't take their leads like they used to, or, or occasionally um, bunny hopping as well. So those would all be some symptoms of arthritis. There are lots of things that can cause arthritis in horses. Um, oftentimes there's a traumatic event that leads to either actual clefts or trauma to the cartilage itself, uh, or potentially some damage to the collateral ligaments or supporting structures of the joint that leads to instability. That instability subsequently leads to inflammation in the joint and damage to the cartilage. Um, synovitis can happen as a result of trauma or some other type of injury. Um, overuse, so especially a young horse that's being put into a whole lot of work. Um, and then conformational abnormalities. So if the horse's leg um, is off, like if they're offset at the knees, the leg's not straight, um, there'll be some abnormal biomechanical forces placed on the limb uh, that, that can um, over time create inflammation and pain. And the inflammatory process in general, regardless of what sets it off, um, releases uh, metabolites of the arachidonic acid cascade, that's a normal process that takes place in the horse's body, but um, that's going to release prostaglandins. Um, and the inflammatory mediators that are released as a result of this process break down the hyaluronic acid in the joint fluid. It also breaks down the articular cartilage. So over time, we have degradation of cartilage, poorer quality joint fluid. Horses with arthritis or inflamed joints generally produce more joint fluid, but of poorer quality. So the joint might be swollen or distended. If I stuck a needle in, the fluid that I get out might be more clear, watery in consistency, and you wouldn't have that viscosity to the fluid um, that you get with normal joint fluid. And over time, you'll start to see bony production, spur formation. When you see bone spurs on x-rays, what that, it, what that represents is the horse trying to stabilize an unstable or unhealthy joint over time. So they're building up bone around the joint to try to to minimize the motion to stabilize an unhealthy event. Um, just as a frame of reference, another um, terminology point that gets a little bit confusing for some people is arthritis versus osteoarthritis. Um, so arthritis, that term itself just means inflammation in the joint. So a horse could have arthritis and cartilage damage uh, without seeing anything radiographically. So in some cases, if we catch it earlier or it's milder and the joint is just inflamed, um, but there hasn't been enough time for bony progression uh, to take place, meaning they build up a lot of bone spurs, remodeling around the joint, which would be osteoarthritis, and that's the difference there. So a horse can have arthritis and have reasonably normal x-rays. But if you, if you look at um, the radiograph on this slide, this horse has 
um, end stage severe osteoarthritis, um, which you can see that there's mineral bony production in soft tissues around the joint. This horse had a severe angular deformity to the limbs. The leg was very crooked, not straight at the knee. Um, that led to uh, the horse trying to stabilize that joint over time as there were abnormal forces um, put on that carpus. Diagnosis wise, in terms of diagnosing arthritis in the horse, that can, that can be very simple or very complicated and challenging depending on the location, the severity, how long it's been going on. Um, so it can be simple or it can be quite complicated, but the bottom line is usually the horse is presenting for lameness or a known injury of some kind. Uh, so we're gonna start with the, the classic lameness examination that probably most horse owners have had to experience at some point. Um, you know, so we watch the horse go on a straight line, on circles, we do flexions. Uh, then we use some local anesthetics to try to figure out where in the leg the horse um, is experiencing pain. And then we move to imaging. Um, typically radiographs are first off, uh, sometimes ultrasound. Ultrasound can be used to diagnose arthritis. Um, we can detect bone spurs that way. Some, sometimes irregularities in the cartilage surface and subchondral bones, so it can potentially be useful. Uh, and then, of course, MRI can give us more information on cartilage and the health of the joint as a whole. So in some cases, we might even recommend uh, an MRI to help us uh, in diagnosing the arthritis. And then I put arthroscopy on here also because, again, because some horses that have arthritis that hasn't really progressed to bony radiographic changes, sometimes the way I will diagnose these horses is on my lamus exam, I might block the joint. The horse improves when I numb the joint, so I know that that's where the horse is painful. And then I x-ray and I don't see a whole lot. Well, I know that the joint still hurts, so I might recommend a diagnostic or exploratory arthroscopy. So I will put the camera into the joint, I would have a cruise around the joint and just evaluate the articular cartilage. Um, and I might, I might detect on that surgical procedure some damaged soft tissue within the joint, plus or minus uh, some eroded or damaged cartilage that hasn't progressed arthritis-wise to the point of, of having radiographic changes, but, but is certainly a significant finding for the horse. Uh, so a diagnostic arthroscopy would be another way um, to diagnose arthritis. Treatments. Uh, so this is where it can get even more complicated. So there are many treatments for arthritis in the horse. Uh, the cheapest and most straightforward treatment for pain in general or arthritis in the horse um, is going to be something like Bute. So Bute is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And we'll talk a little bit more about Bute on the next slide. Um, but generally, the NSAIDs are, are a class of drugs that are anti-inflammatory drugs that inhibit that arachidonic acid cascade that takes place in the body. Um, and usually, non-steroidals inhibit the COX part of the cascade. So uh, there are two pathways in the COX system. So COX-1 typically represents mostly the housekeeping processes, so um, gastric and renal function, uh, vascular function and the circulation of normal hormones in the body, whereas COX-2 um, deals more with the inflammatory responses. So ideally, we would just inhibit the bad stuff, the COX-2 stuff, uh, without inhibiting the good stuff, the COX-1 stuff. So the non-steroidals that inhibit the entire COX pathway, part of the reason for potential side effects with those drugs that are negative is because you're inhibiting the good with the bad. Um, so an example of that would be bute uh, or phenylmutazone. It is the most widely used non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug in the horse, and that is because it's very effective and inexpensive for the most part, but it is a non-selective COX inhibitor. So it, it inhibits those inflammatory substances with prostaglandins at the site of inflammation. That's how it works. It's very good for pain control, particularly we think of it as a good drug for musculoskeletal or lameness type pain. Um, it does have some um, toxicity or, or negative side effects, that would be GI ulceration as well as renal damage. Those are more of a concern if you're giving bute to a sick horse, a dehydrated horse, or if you're giving large doses or over a longer period of time. The average horse can tolerate a gram of bute once or twice a day for a short period of time. Um, regardless, it's an effective pain, um, pain relieving drug for osteoarthritis as well as other conditions. Um, it, it does make them feel better, but you just need to be a little careful with use. And there are some oral and intravenous dosing options for most horse owners. Um, an oral option is the best way to go, and I recommend either the paste or, or the tablets are actually the cheapest way to purchase butte. Um, I have banamine in here just for completeness' sake. 
typically we think of banamine as a better drug for what we say, talk about visceral pain, um, like colic symptoms or abdominal type um, pain. And then bute is more of a musculoskeletal pain drug, but certainly you can give banamine uh, for lameness, arthritis, musculoskeletal pain as well. It technically does have a longer duration of pain control. It is also more expensive, especially the paste or the oral formulation. And it is also a non-selective COX inhibitor. Um, so it has the same potential negative side effects as bute, although um, most veterinarians would tell you that it's the risk is slightly lower with banamine versus bute. Um, again, oral and intravenous dosing options. Um, do not give it intramuscularly, although that is technically on the label. There are some negative com complications that can result from that. And then Equiox or Furacoxib is a newer one to the equine industry, but it's been out for quite a while now. This one is COX-2 selective. So unlike butanbanamine, it inhibits just the bad side of the COX cascade um, and not, for the most part, not um, the homeostasis side. That's the purpose of this drug versus butanbanamine. Um, so less issues with GI and renal toxicity, although technically it's still possible. Uh, unfortunately, it's also not as effective for pain control as butyrbanamine. Um, it does come in an oral or IV formulation. I like Equiox uh, as an option for chronic low-grade pain, so a horse with some arthritis um, that you're just trying to keep comfortable and you want a long-term pain relief option. I think Equiox is a really good way to go because it's safer to give over a longer period of time uh, than butyrbanamine. Surpass is basically a topical type of it, uh, what I, how I explain to horse owners a lot of the time, it's like topical view. It's a topical anti-inflammatory. Uh, there's a similar uh, formulation that's a lower concentration for uh, human medicine. It's called Voltaren. Um, but the drug name is diclofenac sodium. Um, you do need to wear gloves because you will absorb this drug, and it is a much more com concentrated version than, than the human formulation, so do not apply it to yourself. <laughs> um, but you wear gloves and you just rub it onto the skin of the area that you're trying to treat. So for example, for horses that have hawk arthritis, um, sometimes I'll use this as, a, as an adjunct therapy and just uh, rub it on the hawk um, an hour or two before competition. So. A little more direct, but also more expensive method of treatment for arthritis in the horse would be joint injections, which probably most uh, horse owners have, have heard about doing this if they haven't already experienced it. Um, so we're gonna actually put a needle into the joint and administer a steroid. There are several different kinds of steroids we use. I have on this slide pictured the two that I most commonly use in practice, but there are a couple others as well. Um, so Depomedrol usually we use for lower motion joints and Vetalog or Triamcinolone is the drug name we would use for higher motion joints. So this one again inhibits those inflammatory prostaglandins. Um, it does have some potential detrimental effects um, on cartilage over time, but that depends largely on the type of steroid used, the concentration, and the duration. Um, there are also some beneficial effects, as you might imagine, with downgrading that inflammatory response within the joint. So when used appropriately, not a, not a lot of harm. Um, there is always potential for infection when you inject a joint with steroid um, in the horse, and I always try to make sure horse owners understand that uh, because an infection in a joint secondary to a steroid injection is oftentimes a very serious and potentially life-threatening complication for the horse. So there is some risk, however, um, it's a very effective uh, and a more direct way of treating inflammation and pain in the joint once you've diagnosed it. Um, so we perform joint injections in horses very regularly here. Oftentimes we combine our steroid with a hyaluronic acid uh, that tends to get us a little more mileage out of our injection as far as how long it lasts. Uh, and this is, uh, as we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, normal joints do produce hyaluronic acid um, to lubricate that joint um, and so what we're doing with this joint injection is we've got the steroid for anti-inflammatory effects and then we also add hyaluronic acid to kind of replace some of that unhealthy joint to provide some lubrication and viscoelastic support for the joint. Um, so it has a direct inflammatory effect as well. There are also intravenous formulations of hyaluronic acid that can improve the joint environment of a horse as well. Typically legend um, is one we think of for that as well as polyglycan. Uh, high visc and high levet um, are for intra-articular use, so I would use those uh, in combination with steroid for my joint injections. 
IRAC is another intraarticular therapy. So another one where we put a needle into the joint and actually inject a substance into the joint itself. Um, IRAC stands for interleukin receptor antagonist protein. Um, it also has anti-inflammatory and chondroprotective, meaning protection of the cartilage effects. Um, usually when I treat a horse with IRAP, um, I do a series of three treatments. So we harvest blood from the horse. So it's an autologous uh, substance, meaning we harvest their blood, we process it, and we inject back in that product that's made from that horse's blood. Uh, it's typically how it's used. <clears throat> and then uh, I, I usually get three doses out of one pole, at least with this particular product. Um, and I'll do three treatments one to two weeks apart. I have used this both for post-operative cases where uh, maybe I took out an OCD lesion, the horse has a bit of cartilage damage in the joint in the presence of the OCD, and I'm trying to kind of give that horse a head start um, and protect the cartilage as that horse heals. I've used it in that capacity. I've also used it in horses with chronic severe arthritis that maybe aren't responding as well uh, to steroid injections anymore. And sometimes that the IRAP can help those horses where steroids not really helping them as much so I've had some good success with it. Unfortunately, it's a whole lot more money um, than, a, than a steroid injection. So over $1,000 for a course for the three treatments versus uh, $150 for a steroid injection. Uh, platelet-rich plasma is another um, biologic, so a product made from the horse's blood that we would use to treat arthritis. Um, again, we pull the blood from the horse, then what platelet-rich plasma is, is plasma from the blood, but with a higher concentration of platelets than what you find in whole blood. Um, more commonly, PRP has been used in tendon and ligament injuries. Uh, it's got some growth factors in it that are to promote healing. Um, so we will in inject it into a tendon or ligament injury um, to, to promote healing of that injury, but it has also shown clinical improvement when used intraarticularly for um, osteoarthritis and joint inflammation. So that's an example of one of the kits or one of the systems um, for PRP processing. Uh, there's also oral joint supplements, which I will frequently recommend either in conjunction with some of the other treatments I've already mentioned. Um, or just separately, sometimes if it's a milder lameness or a milder case, we might just start with an oral joint supplement and see um, how we do. Oftentimes, most joint supplements for horses that are oral are going to contain glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, both of these, the mechanism of action is not concretely known, um, but glucosamine has got some anti-inflammatory effects, um, increases agrican production, which helps with cartilage repair. Uh, and then chondroitin sulfate promotes um, cartilage matrix production and stimulates glycosamine or glycan um, and collagen synthesis, and then increases that hyaluronic acid, again, that joint lubricant concentration. And the two have shown to be more effective when used in combination than alone, which is why most oral joint supplements uh, contain both glucosamine and chondroitin. So the one that I typically recommend to my clients is some version of Pozaquin, and I, I think which one you use depends a little bit on your horse's work level uh, and severity of disease. Um, but I like Pozaquin because it's one of the oral joint supplements that has the most research behind it to say that you're getting what you paid for. Um, so I think it's a good option that way. Uh, and then in severe osteoarthritis cases where there's bony remodeling, um, None of the other treatments are effective. The horse is lame, uh, even in a walk. Uh, we might recommend surgical fusion of the joints. That can be a very different thing depending on which joint we're talking about. So for the pasturing joint or the lower hock joints um, that are low motion joints, so meaning just the concussion that we talked about, not a lot of flexion, extension, gliding of cartilage surfaces, um, those joints can be fused, specifically the pasture and the bottom two hock joints. Those joints can be fused and the horse can still do very well as an athlete in many cases. Other joints, when we go about fusing them, we're talking about a salvage procedure. So the picture on the left here is a pasture and arthrodesis. That's a pretty standard surgical pasture infusion. And a horse that's had this procedure, um, barring any unforeseen complications, can go back to competition um, oftentimes um, at or just beneath its previous level of performance before the surgery. So uh, that actually carries quite a good prognosis for a lot of horses um, versus a carpus, for example, uh, the knee of the horse, we call it usually, where there's a lot of flexion and extension, a lot of gliding surface there. Um, to fuse the carpus in a horse, 
uh, you can see that this horse had a ton of bony remodeling, very abnormal end stage disease um, joint. Uh, to fuse the entire knee in a horse is an end stage salvage procedure that would just be for the horse to live in a pasture. But regardless, th these would only be things we would recommend for horses where other treatments uh, have failed to work and we're just trying to keep the horse comfortable. But surgical fusion um, is sometimes indicated so for severe arthritis. So those are some of the treatments, causes, uh, a little bit of background information about arthritis in the horse in general. Um, now I'm just going to talk briefly about my current equine arthritis research at Oklahoma State. So um, I'm going to look at a different cause of arthritis, and um, that's obesity. So in people, um, they talk about obesity leading to and complicating arthritis due to mechanical factors, right? There's just more weight on joints that are maybe already compromised, already injured, um, as well as uh, potentially a different aspect, which is what we're investigating, which is the fact that in obese people, there is an increase in circulating inflammatory mediators throughout the body um, of the person. And, and most likely that would include joints. So an increased inflammatory environment in the joint would lead to breakdown of articular cartilage, breakdown of synovial fluid, um, and arthritis over time. So specifically, the question we're asking is, can obesity cause arthritis via increased circulating inflammatory mediators and increased inflammatory mediators in the joint environment themselves? Um, there is an increased incidence of wrist arthritis in people um, who are obese, which fits more with the second of these two obesity-related arthritis causes because the carpus or the wrist is not a weight-bearing joint of the person, right? So it doesn't make sense that increased load on those joints uh, from a weight standpoint would be what's causing the arthritis. So what we're doing is trying to establish the horse as an animal model to study arthritis associated with obesity with or without metabolic disease in humans. So both humans and horses suffer from some met metabolism or metabolic disease issues as well that have, are oftentimes associated with obesity and have even more of a ramped up inflammatory response, circulating inflammatory response in the body um, than just an obese person alone or an obese horse alone. Uh, so we're trying to recruit some more horses for this study. Um, we've got about 10 or 11 that we've done so far. What we need is obese horses. So an obese horse, especially for the um, categorization for this study is a horse, need, the horse needs to have a body condition score of a seven and eight or a nine and the horse can or cannot have equine metabolic syndrome because we're putting horses into both categories. So we have a normal group, an obese group, and then an obese group with equine metabolic syndrome. Uh, we'd like to keep them between the age range of five and 22 years of age. Um, and I've just got uh, a little excerpt from the body condition scoring chart to give you a better idea of what exactly a seven or eight, an eight or a nine means in terms of body condition scoring. So a seven, you can still feel the ribs, but there's a lot of fat filling in the ribs. They've got some deposition of fat along the neck, along the withers. They may have a crease down their back. Um, they'll have some soft fat around their tail head, behind the shoulder, and generally they just have a more fleshy appearance to them. And eight, it starts to be where we can't, we have a difficult time feeling the ribs. Uh, the neck will be thick. The area around the withers, again, is filled with fat. Um, they will have a crease down their back as well as fat around the tail head that's very soft um, and fat behind the shoulder. And then a nine would be a severely obese horse. The scale runs from, uh, from one to nine. So a nine would be the extreme. Um, patchy fat over the ribs, um, bulging fat along the neck, along the withers, a very obvious crease down the back, bulging fat around the tail head and behind the shoulders. And we would call that horse extreme fat. So a seven, eight, or a nine is what we need for the study. Um, Procedures that will be performed on any horse that's enrolled in this study. So they'll get a thorough physical examination. Then they will have a fasted glucose and insulin drawn as well as an intravenous glucose tolerance test. Um, so we administer dextrose in the vein and then we um, take samples of their, of their glucose and insulin thereafter uh, via blood sampling. That's to determine um, the insulin sensitivity status for that horse and whether or not they have equine metabolic syndrome. Uh, from there, we will do a full lameness examination on the horse. So palpate all the joints of the horse, um, do flexion tests, see if any of those flexions make the horse worse. Um, and then they also get an objective lameness assessment via our lameness locator software um, and force plate gate analysis at our research park here. 
After their lamus examination, they'll have radiographs taken uh, of both stifles, both hocks, and the temporal mandibular joints. And the reason for the temporal mandibular joint is because we wanted to have a weight-bearing and a non-weight-bearing uh, joint included in the study to assess for radiographic evidence of arthritis and then to look at synovial fluid uh, and synovial membrane for inflammatory mediators of the joint that we suspect will be upregulated in horses that are obese and horses with equine metabolic syndrome. Um, so that's what they'll get x-rayed. After all of that is done, the horse will have a general anesthetic, at which point um, it will have a CT examination of its temporal mandibular joints. CT is the gold standard for evaluating um, the TMJ in people. And so we've opted to do CT for those in horses as well. And then we will take them to surgery. They will have uh, arthros arthroscopic evaluation of one stifle and one temporal mandibular joint. So small incisions, we'll just put a camera in, have a look around the joint, evaluate the articular cartilage, get some pictures of that. We will take a joint fluid sample at that time, and then we'll take some biopsies of that finger-like synovial membrane that I showed you in one of the earlier slides of the presentation. In the stifle, we'll, we will also take some biopsies of the fat pad that sits under the patella, and that's because in human beings, again, um, more inflammatory mediators have been localized in the fat pad of the stifle joint um, as opposed to other um, joints. So that's why surgically we're looking at the temporal mandibular joint because it's a non-weight bearing joint that we are able to scope in the horse. The carpus in the horse, unlike the person, is a weight bearing joint. Um, so we can't use that and then the cycle uh, because of the fat pad component. So what's in it for you? It's a lot, it's a lot to put a horse through. So what, what does it get you if you enroll your horse in this study? Um, so you get free testing to establish the insulin, insulin sensitivity status of your horse. If your horse does have a decreased insulin sensitivity or equine metabolic syndrome, um, we would give you some management or treatment recommendations for that. Uh, you will get a free lameness workup, including subjective lameness evaluation, horse plate analysis, um, and examination with the lameness locator. You get a full set of radiographs of both stifles, both pox, and both temporal mandibular, temporal mandibular joints, and you will get a copy of that. Um, and then uh, the CT examination, you're welcome to copies of that as well um, if you're interested. And then any abnormalities or findings of osteoarthritis that we diagnose uh, when we're looking at the stifles, fox, or TMJ. So if we find anything in those locations, um, you would get treatment recommendations uh, for what to do about that, as well as a $250 stipend. So we just give you a check for $250 for every course that you want to study. So if you want some more information on this project, um, you can go to the vet school's website, so cvhs.okstate.edu, go under the research tab, and then clinical trials, large animal, um, and you'll see the obesity and OA study or osteoarthritis study, or you can contact me directly. You can call the large animal clinic at 744-7000 or just shoot me an email. Um, we can talk about whether or not it sounds like your horse would fit in the study and go from there. So please can consider contributing um, to OSU research. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions.